of love and friendship. Whatever you show consideration for, you are naturally inclined to love. Now no one, of course, shows consideration for what's bad any more than they do for things that they have no connection with. It follows that people only show consideration for what is good. And if they show consideration for it, they must also love it. So the person who knows what is good is also the person who knows how to love. But if someone is incapable of distinguishing good things from bad and neutral things from either, well, how could such a person be capable of love? The power to love, then, belongs only to the wise man. Wait a minute, I hear someone say. I'm no wise man, but I love my child nonetheless. First of all, I am surprised, I must say, that you would admit to not being wise. After all, what's missing? Your senses are in working order. You differentiate among impressions, and you give your body the right food, clothing, and housing. So how is it you say you aren't wise? I'll tell you myself. It's because you are frequently dazed or disturbed by certain sense impressions whose appearance of truth gets the better of you. Sometimes you think that some things are good, then you consider the same things bad, and later you decide that they're indifferent. In other words, you're subject to sorrow, fear, jealousy, anger, and inconsistency. That's the real reason you should admit that you are not wise. In love and friendship, you are also inconsistent, are you not? I mean, money, pleasure, and the rest, you sometimes take to be good, at other times bad. Isn't it the same with people? Don't you regard the same ones as good and bad at varying times? Sometimes they're your friend, later your enemy. And you sing their praises only later to run them down. Yes, I admit that too. So, do you think that you can be the friend of someone if you hold the wrong opinion about them? Naturally, no. What if your opinion of them is subject to change? Can your relations be warm? No again. And, if you alternate praise of them with disparagement? No, not then either. All right. No doubt you have seen dogs playing with and fawning before each other and thought nothing could be friendlier. But just throw some meat in the middle and then you'll know what friendship amounts to. Put a piece of real estate in the center between you and your son and you'll know how impatient he is to bury you and how even you are wishing your son were dead. Then you say, Some child I raise, he's been planning my funeral for years. Place a pretty girl in the middle, and the old man falls for her as hard as the boy. Or dangle some honor or another before the two of you. If you have to risk your life, you'll repeat the words of Admetus's father. You want to see the light, don't you? You imagine your father does too? Don't you think he loved his son when the boy was small? Suffered when he was sick and could be heard saying, If only I could be sick in his place. But, faced with a genuine choice, they have only insults to exchange, as you see. Eteocles and Polynices didn't they share the same mother and father? They were reared together, lived together, and drank together. Anyone seeing them would almost certainly have mocked the philosophers with their notorious views on friendship. Yet when the question came up between them of who would be king, it was like meat thrown before a pack of dogs. 
Here is what they said. Where before the tower do you intend to stand? What business is it of yours? I want to be directly opposite so that I can kill you personally. And I am seized by the same desire. They even petition the gods for that favor. It is a universal law, have no illusions, that every creature alive is attached to nothing so much as its own self-interest. Whatever threatens to stand in the way of that, be it brother, father, child, or sweetheart, he will hate, curse, and prosecute, because he is naturally disposed to favor primarily his own interest. This is his father, his brother, his relations, his country, and his God. If we believe the gods to be hostile to our individual interest, then we are as ready to turn on them as on the others, knocking their statues over and burning down their temples. Witness Alexander, who ordered the shrines of Asclepius' torch after his beloved died. The upshot is that if you identify self-interest with piety, honesty, country, parents, and friends, then they are all secure. But separate them and friends, family, country, and morality itself all come to nothing, outweighed by self-interest. Wherever me and mine are, that's where every creature necessarily tends. If we locate them in the body, then the body will be the dominant force in our lives. If it's in our faculty of will, then that will dominate. Likewise with externals. But only if I identify with my will can I be someone's friend or son or father in the true sense, because only then will my self-interest be served by remaining loyal, honest, patient, tolerant, and supportive, and by maintaining my social relations. If I put myself in one place and put honor anywhere else, the consequence will be to strengthen the view of Epicurus, as set forth in his declaration that honor is nothing, and if it does exist, it is only what is generally approved. Ignorance of this made the Athenians turn on the Spartans, and the Thebans on both, made the Persian king invade Greece, and the Macedonians invade both. And now the Romans have been induced to turn against the Gete. Going further back, it was the cause of the Trojan War. Paris was Menelaus' guest, and anyone who saw how well they treated each other would have laughed at anyone who said they weren't friends. But between the two, a bit of temptation was thrown in the form of a beautiful woman. And over that, there arose war. So now, if you see friends or brothers who appear to be of like mind, don't draw any conclusions about their friendship right away, even if they swear oaths and say that neither can live one without the other. A bad person's character cannot be trusted. It's weak and indecisive. Easily won over by different impressions at different times. Don't make the common mistake of only asking, Do they share parents? Or, Did they grow up together? Or, Did they attend the same school? Just ask whether they put their self-interest in externals or in moral choice. If it's in externals, you cannot call them friends any more than you can call them trustworthy, consistent, courageous, or free. You cannot even call them human beings if you think about it, because it is no human frame of mind that makes people snap at others and insult them, or take to the marketplace the way 
bandits take to the desert or mountains and behave like bandits in court, or that turns them into depraved lechers and adulterers, or is responsible for all other crimes that people commit against each other. Their only cause is the frame of mind that sets the self and its interests anywhere except in the realm of choice. But if you hear of people who are sincere in identifying virtue with choice and the use of impressions, don't bother with whether they are members of the same family or friends who've run together for a long time. Knowing this is enough to say with confidence that they are friends, just as it's enough to judge them fair and reliable. For where else is friendship found, if not with fairness, reliability, and respect for virtue only? But she has looked after me for such a long time. Did she not love me? How do you know, stupid, if she hasn't looked after you the way she polishes her shoes, say, or attends to her farm animals? How do you know she won't discard you like broken glass once your value as a utensil is used up? But she's also my wife, and we've lived together for years. And Eraphile, how long was she with Ampharius, the mother, too, of his many children? But a necklace came between them. And by necklace, I mean her whole attitude toward externals. That was the inhuman factor that destroyed their love and would not permit the woman to remain a wife or the mother to remain a mother. If any of you are serious about being a friend, rid yourself of such attitudes, condemn them, and drive them out of your mind. That way, you won't be hard on yourself or be forever fighting, second-guessing, and tormenting yourself and then you will be in a condition to befriend others, forming easy and natural relationships with like-minded people, but capable, too, of treating unenlightened souls with sympathy and indulgence, remembering that they are ignorant or mistaken about what's most important. Never be harsh. Remember Plato's dictum. Every soul is deprived of the truth, against its will. If you don't get rid of these attitudes, however, you may do all the things friends typically do together, like drink, board, and travel. You can even have the same ancestry, but so can snakes. They can never be friends, though, and neither can you, as long as you hold on to these hateful and inhuman judgments.